Hello, and welcome to the University of Washington's Workforce Webinar, Keeping the Faith While Keeping It Real, with Dr. Georgiana Sedlar and Dr. Maria Monroe DeVita. My name is Kathia Carey, I'm with the University of Washington's Public Behavioral Health and Justice Policy, and I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items before we started the webinar. First, please join us uh, in person on May 12th, 2016 at the University of Washington's School of Social Work for our last lecture of the year. This lecture will be with Dr. Robert Hilt, discussing community service needs and child mental health and the ongoing movement to better integrated healthcare services. Secondly, our presenters would like to thank Dr. Suzanne Kearns and Rosalind Peterson for providing them support and research on this webinar. And lastly, if you have any questions uh, you would like addressed by our presenters or any questions in general about this lecture series, Please email me directly at cmc37 at uw.edu. Again, that's cmc37 at uw.edu. Thanks so much, Kathia, and hello, everyone. My name is Maria Monroe DeVita, and I'm going to go ahead and start us off today. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk with you about a topic I know many of us have interest and tremendous investment in, and yet we all often struggle with how best to do so in a practical, feasible, and efficient manner. I also want to preface this talk by telling you all that while my, much of my work centers around implementation and mental health services research related to evidence-based practices for adults with serious mental illness in particular, I also come at this work and this particular topic as a clinician actively working in the field, as does my colleague and co-presenter Georgiana, in fact. So I think that's worth stating so that you can all fully understand we really do get both perspectives in thinking about treatment or program fidelity, and this is why this is really important to us. So without further ado, let's talk about the plan for today. Um, here's a brief overview of our agenda. We'll spend just a little bit of time briefly getting on the same page about what fidelity is and how approaches may be different depending on how you're applying your fidelity data. But we'll spend most of our time covering two case examples. The first one, which I'll be talking about, has to do with an approach to fidelity at the program level. This case study focuses on the adult EBP world, but I think it can be translated to other EBPs, especially those that are team-based or multimodal. In fact, my colleagues here at University of Washington recently developed a similar tool and approach to wraparound services on the kids' side. Um, then Georgiana will spend some time talking about a system or state-level approach to fidelity across various EBPs in the children's mental health system uh, here in Washington State. We'll then finish with next steps, and we'll tell you a little bit more about a paper Georgiana and I, along with our colleagues Sue Kearns and Rosalind Peterson, are writing on this very topic. So what is fidelity anyway? We thought it would be interesting to start with the definition of, of fidelity from the dictionary, where we found three possible definitions, all of which I think you'll see resonate as we apply it within our context. Uh, the first is the state of being faithful. The second, telling us that you know it's, it's about being accurate or exact. And the third, well, a little off course in terms of the media application, has to do with the need for accurate replication, which I think is kind of what we're talking about overall in our context. And when we say that we're evaluating program or treatment fidelity, it's really just a fancy way of saying that we're assessing the degree to which the program or treatment adheres to the intended model. Some people like to use the term adherence sort of interchangeably. Or as my friend and colleague Lucy Berner, Berliner likes to say, it's about are they doing it versus can they do it, which is more about assessing competence. There are a number of different purposes of fidelity assessment, many of which are listed here. Uh, namely, it's helpful to see whether you've hit your mark or have a model to go by if you want to replicate it elsewhere. Uh, also, given the research showing a high proportion of EBPs getting watered down over time, it can be a helpful tool to prevent drift. It also has a number of different research purposes. In fact, that's really where this all came about, um, including the fact that it allows you to more fully interpret and understand your outcomes. If a particular aspect of the treatment wasn't even implemented, that enables you to understand why you didn't have an impact on those related outcomes. But lastly, and perhaps most central, to our discussion today, fidelity evaluations are increasingly used to guide performance improvement or uh, other QI or QA efforts. 
Sure, outcomes are really the most important thing at the end of the day, but giving clinicians, giving clinicians information about what they're doing or not doing to get to those outcomes can be really powerful. So we see this process as really essential for ensuring quality program implementation. Another way to think about the various purposes of fidelity is to approach it through the eyes of different stakeholders in this process. So at the participant and family level, it's just good to know what the treatment entails and that you're getting good, solid services. And as I said earlier, at the end of the day, client outcomes are the most important thing. We know across various treatments and EVPs that high fidelity to the model is tied to better outcomes. At the program level, this is really where we see the tie to quality assurance. Knowing a clinician's strengths as well as skills in need of improvement can really help to target the efforts of those in a supervisory role. And there are a number of specific EVPs. I'm sure you are involved in them uh, as I speak. And the related purveyors are out there and require fidelity assessment to be a part of that implementation package. I already spoke to several of the research applications in my last slide, so I'm going to skip past these, but put them here to just remind us of the fact that these are big drivers for making sure a fidelity assessment is done. And then at the policy and administrative levels, you know, they really see it as investing in what works. And by doing so, they're not reinventing the wheel, and essentially that results in being more cost effective. You're not you know, going out and doing trial, trial and error and implementation. We also know, um, especially in the world that I work in, that sometimes outcomes come more slowly, um, especially those that have to do with sort of longer term functional outcomes. And so to only use outcomes as the uh, main way of getting feedback can take a long time versus at least assessing fidelity helps to know that you're sort of on the right trajectory or on track to get to those outcomes over time. And when you think about the various stakeholders and what they're trying to balance in their decision making related to whether or how to approach a fidelity review, and I'm really only talking about those who are in a decision making role here, the biggest concern that comes up is that balance between accuracy. Um, in other words, are we truly tapping whether people can do this particular practice or skill and the feasibility of embarking on what is often a fairly burdensome task, unfortunately. I've listed here um, a few ways in which this approach can be a little bit burdensome. Um, I think the matter is just how much burden, burden are we talking about. Many of the gold standard approaches for fidelity assessment are not so feasible. And by that I mean the typical approach of having multiple treatment sessions, audio or videotaped and listened to and rated by an independent expert often means listening to five to ten sessions before being deemed a high fidelity clinician in that particular EVP, that, that can be kind of unfeasible. Um, several less burdensome approaches have been implemented. For example, having clinicians self-rate their sessions by endorsing which practice elements they've used. Uh, but again, those approaches do have some inherent bias. The question is, do we really know if they can do it? And if so, is this a good enough method? Sadly, in many cases, we really don't know. Um, there's a dearth of empirical research out there on practical approaches to fidelity assessment. Uh, our team actually reviewed 84 articles and only four to date provided information about practical fidelity that had research support. And two of those articles were actually from members of our team. So it tells you a little bit about where we need to go. And Georgiana will talk a little bit about that in our uh, next step slides. So I'm, now that I've set the stage, I want to talk about the first case study, which focuses on development and implementation of a fidelity tool for the Assertive Community Treatment or ACT model. It is of note that several EVPs for adults with SMI, like Support Employment and Integrated Dual Disorder Treatment, for example, use a similar fidelity approach as ACT. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, on the kids side, Wraparound is using a similar approach within their suite of fidelity tools. But I do think this work translates to other programs and treatments, especially those that are multi multimodal and team-based. So I think it's really something that we should consider for other kinds of treatments and, and would be applicable. 
Before I get into it, I just want to give a quick shout out to my colleagues, Lorna Moser and Greg Teague, with whom I've been working on this project and approach um, for the better part of a decade now. Um, these are kind of the results of our work that are continuing uh, today. Um, so what is ACT? Just briefly, I want to let you know kind of more about what the program is so that you can better appreciate why it is particularly um, difficult uh, to, and challenging to develop a fidelity uh, tool and approach to this particular model. ACT is an EBP for adults with SMI, serious mental illness, which includes those with schizophrenia spectrum and bipolar disorder, as well as those with significant functional impairments and high service needs. It's a team-based approach to service provision, which means that every single team member knows about what is happening with every single consumer served by the team. And because it is a multidisciplinary team, they have the capacity to directly provide a range of services and do not broker to other programs, as is common among traditional case management programs. ACT is not office-based. Services are provided in consumers' homes and communities with the capacity to provide services at a high level of intensity and frequency. A big misconception of ACT is that it is only a case management model and that many of the services entail only doing for clients rather than teaching them to do the skills for themselves. But case management is really only one of several comprehensive services an ACT team should offer. And I'll show you some of those examples of those kinds of services in a moment. And lastly, while the team should be assertive in its approach, this should never mean that they are coercive. And I think this has been sort of a historic problem with the ACT um, nationally. Uh, but in sort of revamping and, and really making sure that the model sort of fits with the times, we really focus more on and, and need to focus more on, I think, if we want to get the outcomes that are needed in ACT, that person-centered approaches that promote consumer self-determination and independence are really key and an integral part of the model. So here's an illustration of services typically delivered within an ACT team. You've got the pharmacological treatment uh, sort of at the top there, and then a range of other psychosocial interventions, many of which are EBPs in their own right. Um, and then you've got case management as well. So often there is sort of an intertwining of the two where you might be providing case management within an ACT team, going to the grocery store or uh, to the benefits office or doing job coaching. And you're also at the same time, you might be doing some motivational interviewing or um, talking about um, substance use or helping to better understand what the person's you know, fears are around changing diet and those kinds of things. So they're interwoven. And the problem, as you can see, is that many of these other EBPs, um, or I should say other services, are actually EBPs in and of themselves. And many of them have their own fidelity tools to go with them. So it starts to become a dilemma when you think about how you approach fidelity. And to make matters a little bit more tricky, um, within, embedded within many of these EBPs are other empirically supported approaches like motivational interviewing and CBT, so it just continues to complicate the matters and you can see that a complex theme is emerging and why assessing fidelity to this kind of program may pose a little bit of a challenge. So I want to talk a little bit about where our story starts. It starts with an outdated ACT fidelity tool, the Dartmouth Assertive Community Treatment Scale or the DAX. Uh, it's the original tool used to assess fidelity to the ACT model. It has 28 items and each item is ranked or rated, I should say, along a five-point behaviorally anchored scale. And you can see right here an example item, responsibility for crisis services. So the ACT team is supposed to provide crisis services. And then you can see how they would rate when they provide various um, iterations on that theme. Again, with five being the highest and one being the lowest rating where you, they haven't fully implemented that particular uh, fidelity element. And this is the same format, this one to five uh, rating across those 28 elements of fidelity assessed within the DAX. The method they use is a one-day site review using a range of data sources, and this approach had to be different than what is typically used for traditional psychotherapy programs. You can imagine it's difficult to do video or audio taping because most of those services are provided out of the office um, to really be true to ACT, and there are multiple team members delivering a variety of different interventions, so it gets pretty complicated pretty fast. 
The problem is that the tool was originally developed for a specific study and gained popula popularity because it was the only fidelity tool out there for ACT. And then over time, there were other, uh, the Active Program Manual, the SAMHSA toolkits were developed, so it was developed before any of that. Um, the, the National ACT Program standards were developed, and there's some kind of disalignment um, between the DACs and, and those standards nationally. And perhaps most importantly to our discussion today, there are a number of measurement gaps within the DACs. Essentially, the DACs is focused more on what an ACT team should look like, but not as much on what an ACT team does or what are the services that they provide. And unfortunately, historically at least, we haven't seen as many positive outcomes in uh, ACT teams um, in those particular areas that they really should have an impact on, such as improved independent social functioning and getting folks back to work and retaining their employment over time. We think that part of the reason that we haven't seen those outcomes in ACT is because teams have really not been held accountable to providing the kinds of services that would lead to those very outcomes. And so this is where we are today. This is why we felt the need to implement um, this particular type of fidelity tool. Again, these are the kinds of services and programs that aren't in the DACs and really should be. And yet, we know that we have to strike a balance, um, that just because the DAX has some gaps, if we start to sort of broaden the scope or delve a little deeper into what an ACT team should be doing, there may be some trade-offs as far as other kinds of burden, which I talked about earlier. Person power, training, workload, time, even funding to really be able to implement any sort of fidelity assessment that goes beyond what the DAX did. So we recognize that. And we really tried to strike a balance as we started with our original 28 DAX items. Uh, we removed six of them, uh, particularly those that didn't seem to be particular to ACT um, and are really just based on what is a good, good clinical practice anyway. Um, we added 25 new items then, and we ended up with 47 items in our uh, final fidelity tool. And here's what it looks like, just briefly. Um, there are those 47 items, again, using that same five-point anchored scale, one being you know, that that particular element was not implemented, and five being the highest uh, implementation. And then six subscales, the first of which is operations and structure, which really gets at what a lot of the DACs assessed, the extent to which it looks like an ACT team. But then we have six other, I'm sorry, five other subscales that get at more sort of the processes. We have core team and special, specialist team, which get at the various team members and the role within the team in, in delivering evidence-based practices. We also get at specific core practices that are the hallmark of ACT, as well as the integration of evidence-based practices. So again, kind of thinking back to that Venn diagram I showed you earlier, what are the other EVPs that should be integrated with an ACT? And then making sure that, again, recovery-oriented, person-centered approaches are also reflected within the ACT team and that there isn't sort of this default to more coercive practice. In developing this tool and approach, we knew that we had to tackle a number of inherent dilemmas within this particular model, which I'm sure you would, could probably start to name now that I've sort of set the stage for this. We've got many team members delivering the interventions. We've got a variety of interventions um, often provided within the team and tailored to, to the clients. We have services that are carried out any time of day. Again, this is sort of round-the-clock service, and, it, and the team has the capacity to provide services multiple times a day. You've got a service setting that is often in clients' homes and communities, which makes it tough to assess. And then, again, sort of making sure that we've got this recovery-oriented uh, practice embedded within the model. And while many of them have a strong philosophical basis, some of them have not been as well articulated in terms of what are the actual practices that are recovery-oriented. So that's the other part of the dilemma. So the first thing that we did was to adopt a similar approach to the DAX, which is, again, a similar approach used by other EVP fidelity tools in the adult SMI area, but with a few adaptations. Um, for starters, we take a little longer. The fidelity assessments include about a one-and-a-half to two-day uh, on-site review with the ACT team. 
And, you know, you can say, wow, that's a lot of time and resource to do act fidelity assessments. But again, these reviews typically occur only annually. And in many states, including my own, if teams score above a certain fidelity rating and don't have a lot of staff turnover, they can actually have a pass um, and then have their fidelity review the next year. So sometimes it can even be every other year. Um, and again, think about the context. Think about what the alternative is as far as sort of other gold standard approaches. We're not saying that just because an ACT team is supposed to be using CBT for psychosis that then every clinician who does CBT for psychosis needs to use, who uses it, needs to have six to ten of their audio tape sessions rated for, for fidelity. That would happen, all happen within the context of this particular fidelity review. And then we use a mix of data sources. We've got these, um, I have often been called indirect data sources. Um, the team will send us information about their program as far as the kinds of clients that they're serving, um, the team roster, um, the kinds of services that they think that they're, that they're delivering to their clients before the review. Uh, we get that information beforehand. Um, and then on site, we conduct interviews with team members to get a sense of what they think that they're delivering to various clients. We talk to the people served within the program to get a sense of, of their feel for what their, their ag team is doing, what they like about it, what they don't like about it, the kinds of you know, things that the ACT team is doing with them as far as specific services. We also conduct a chart review, which is a random selection of 20% of the, of the entire team sample. And then we also try, not try, this is actually embedded within the, the protocol, we actually then take a look at direct data sources. And this is where we try to strike a balance between sort of self-report, which are kind of more reflected in these indirect data sources, um, although the chart review at least can be a little bit more objective, uh, as well as then observation, direct observation of service delivery while we're on site, listening in on their daily team meeting to get a sense of what are the services that were provided over the last 24 hours, and observing a treatment planning meeting to get a sense of what that process um, and, the, and the structure as well, what, what those look like. And then we provide a draft report and do a feedback meeting with the team, and it's only after that that then we finalize um, finalize the report. Another method, methodological approach that we've taken is to say that for each on-site review, there will be two fidelity reviewers. They conduct some parts of the review together while also divvying up some of the tasks to make the review only that one and a half to two days versus several days if there were only one person doing it. And then after the review, they go through the 47 items and independently rate each of them on that one to five scale, and they come together to develop consensus ratings. And what I love about this approach is that the fidelity results, fidelity review results aren't beholden to one lone reviewer's perspective. So you've got kind of two people sort of hashing it out um, and might have some different perspectives based on what they did over the course of that, those two days um, together on site to then come to sort of what we hope is more of the, the real sense of what's happening within the team. As you can see here, based on state data that we have, several states have taken a variety of approaches to identifying who those two uh, independent reviewers are. As you can see, most states um, ensure that somebody from their state mental health authority is conducting fidelity reviews. And actually, in Washington state, that used to be our model, although we've shifted over to having our university-based um, TA center work with ACT team members. And I'll talk a little bit about that approach in a minute. You can also see that many states have invested in having sort of an independent review from a TA center or, you know, center for evidence-based practice, again, as we do in Washington state. And what I really like, and I'm, I'm going to be curious to see as we collect more data on this, how feasible these particular approaches are, but I think it's very promising, is that we're also in... Uh, working with ACT team members. So in some states, for example, in Minnesota and North Carolina, these are actually team leaders from teams who co-review with another uh, lead reviewer. So in Minnesota, it's somebody from the Mental Health Authority. Um, in North Carolina, it's a mix of the Mental Health Authority and their TA center at University of North Carolina. But what that does is it helps to not only embed the perspective of 
a, an actual team member within the Fidelity Review, but it also provides an opportunity for those team members to actually improve Fidelity within their own teams when they go home. So they get to kind of see Fidelity from a different perspective, and I think it's a different way of learning, really. The other thing I think that will be interesting is sort of thinking about how you might apply this particular tool with team self-assessment. Um, in Minnesota, they had started this process and switched to more of an independent review process. But in the state of New York, we're actually embarking on a study to get a sense of um, how do teams own self-assessments where they kind of you know, model the same approach but, um, but actually come up with their own fidelity ratings. How do those fit with independent reviews of those same teams and getting a sense of whether there's consistency um, within inter-rater reliability within those two approaches. So I think that's going to be a really interesting and, and potentially emerging area. And certainly when you think of um, more practical, efficient ways of, of doing this work, that certainly is a little less burdensome, although I guess it is more burdensome on the teams, but it doesn't require a lot more people to be involved in that process. So stay tuned to that approach. Um, the last two areas I'm going to talk about is less about the methodology and then more about the actual structure of the tool and how you can kind of um, finesse it a little bit to really get it um, more core um, aspects of practice. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the problems with the DAX is that it really focused more on what an ACT team looks like and less about what kinds of services an ACT team should be providing um, and the functioning of the team as well. So less about process and more about structure. And the problem is how do you assess the nature and quality of, of some of those core elements? And our approach, you know, I will admit we cheated a little. Um, if you've ever taken um, a measure development class, you will be told never to bundle criteria or never have double barreled items or those kinds of things. Well, you know what? we would have had a 147 item tool if we had followed that approach. So we did actually bundle criteria within items that assess a common construct. And then we developed rating guidelines for each of those criteria so that it didn't, it wasn't confusing to fidelity reviewers as far as how to give credit. And I think that's really where the problem lies when you have multiple criteria or bundled criteria within items. So as an example, um, we've got person-centered planning. So Again, I mentioned earlier that we're trying to ensure that ACT teams are not coercive and that they're really empowering the people they're serving to be more actively involved in their, in their treatment. And one of the hallmarks of that is a, a, its own sort of EVP in and of, of itself, person-centered treatment planning. And so what we're saying is ACT teams need to be doing and embedding person-centered treatment planning within their treatment planning with clients. And you can see we've kind of listed out five different functions of person-centered planning. And then across the five uh, ratings, we have variations on the theme of how you can get credit and then provide um, reviewers with guidelines on how you would give that credit. So this is just for function number five, which is that the team is providing guidance and support to promote client self-direction. And we provide very specific uh, criteria for how you would give full credit just for that one function. And again, there are five different functions. So this for this one function, we are at least wanting to uh, ensure more accuracy, accuracy and valid and reliable data by doing it this way. Another problem, and it's, it's kind of similar to the one I just described, is that integration of other EVPs. Again, if ACT is a platform for delivering a comprehensive set of services based on individual treatment needs, needs ideally they're going to be integrating other EVPs or EBTs to address those needs. And the problem is, again, that each of these EVPs have, many of them have their own fidelity tools. So how do you do that without coming up with a really complex structure? So our approach was really to embed several different types of items within the tool itself. We assess the quality of interventions delivered by specific team members by looking at the specific specialists within the teams and, and really specifying what kinds of interventions they should be sort of waving the flag or, or uh, wearing the hat in delivering. So making sure that they're really taking the lead in the team and delivering those. A second way is to examine the extent to which the full team overall is embracing the philosophy and practice of each type of those other 
evidence-based practices. And the third way is to evaluate penetration rate of each type of intervention. So again, these are examples of three different kinds of items that we have embedded within our tool um, in order to really get at that sort of full integration of other EVPs. And again, going back to, we haven't had the outcomes that we really want in ACT, so this is one way of, of getting there, holding teams accountable to those practices. This is an example of one of those items, um, the extent to which, which the full team is embracing more of an integrated dual disorder treatment model. And again, we've got rating guidelines for Fidelity reviewers so that they know, for example, for Criterion 2, um, the full team does not have absolute expectations of abstinence. How do you give full, partial, or no credit to that particular criterion and make the full rating across the various criteria for that particular item? I'm looking at my time and I'm realizing I'm getting a little bit close and I want to make sure Jordana has plenty of time to talk about her important projects. So I just want to end this by saying um, and, and giving you a little bit about just how successful this approach has been. It's all well and good to say we've specified some, you know, a particular way of doing this within ACT, but do we have any data to support its feasibility, acceptability, and outcomes. And I do have some of that. Um, you'll have these uh, PowerPoint handouts, so you can refer to them um, at your leisure. So I'm going to just go through them very quickly. But I think the fact that, that many states have sort of shifted over from the DACs to the TEAM Act in a very short period of time, we've got 17 different states now using the TEAM Act, I think says something about feasibility and acceptability. We're working in states, many states, uh, particularly the particularly those in the dark blue, are actually implementing the TEAM Act statewide with the light blue states implementing it in more kind of smaller pilot sites. And what we have been able to see is that the DAX is a more sensitive tool, uh, that it assesses those kinds of things that we want to get uh, assessed to get to the kinds of outcomes that we need with an ACT. Um, we see that also matching across the various um, subscale. So, for example, specialist team, evidence-based practices, and person-centered planning and practices, those particular areas have not been as strong. They're not scoring as well, but what we're seeing is that teams are starting to get better. Um, that's important. That's where we want to get to. We see the same thing across many states. We've got valid and reliable data from seven different U.S. states across 144 ACT teams, and we see a very similar pattern across the various subscales within ACT. Again, yeah, it's pretty easy to look like an ACT team, but what about the kinds of practices that you should be delivering with an ACT team? And again, we're seeing gradual improvement over time with these. And what about outcomes? I think this is really the direction we want to move in uh, within ACT Fidelity. We do have some initial data to show predictive validity um, for ACT, for the Team Act, uh, finding that higher Team Act scores were associated with um, hospital utilization as well as uh, crisis stabilization. And in our recent correlational study, which uh, we're going to be publishing soon, we also found that fidelity, according to the Team Act, was associated with client retention and treatment as well as client employment. Again, this, especially that second one, is a huge one that we're really wanting to make an impact on. And so I think this is very promising and, and, and I'm hopeful for the future in this particular approach. I'll now shift gears um, to Georgiana and let her tell you about um, her important project, and it was wonderful to talk with you all today. Thank you. Hi, Maria. That was uh, a great example of um, a uh, really practical approach to uh, measuring fidelity and um, really impressed with all your effort. Um, I'm definitely going to shift gears now. Um, and I'll be taking a few steps back, quite a few steps back, actually, from Maria's example and talk about a much broader a practical approach, uh, what I call the 30,000-foot view. Um, listeners may be familiar with legislation that passed now almost uh, nearly four years ago um, that wrote into law the use of evidence-based and research-based prevention and intervention services um, across um, multiple systems of care, so children's mental health, child welfare, and juvenile justice. And the law basically states that the prevention and intervention services delivered to children and juveniles um, be primarily evidence-based and research-based, 
And then as you can see, the specific language around um, that speaks to fidelity says um, it's to use monitoring and quality control procedures designed to measure fidelity with evidence-based and research-based prevention programs. So it's great that there was an acknowledgement of um, being able to require that there was some kind of fidelity, um, but there wasn't much more guidance or specification provided uh, regarding how to accomplish this task. So that leads to the next slide. So um, as part of this legislation, um, a listing of programs were reviewed and they were designated as either evidence-based practice, research-based practice, or promising practice according to certain definitions that were um, specific to Washington State and placed on um, the inventory that you see here. And this is just a screenshot. This is just one page of a multiple page report. Um, the link is down below on the screen. So as, when you get these slides, you can, you can access that on the web if you'd like. Um, WISIP, or the Washington State Institute for Public Policy, the research arm of the legislature, did these analyses to determine if a program made it on the list or not, um, and then the inventory gets periodically updated. So I wanted to just show you this screenshot to give everyone a sense of the, the number of programs that could count as research or evidence-based. So while Maria gave a great example of one program, we're talking about you know, that program times times many more, and so you can appreciate um, sort of what's, what's involved and how daunting um, the, the task can be. And um, as, you, as you saw, there's, so we know there's many research-based programs and evidence-based programs on the inventory, and we also know that provider organizations um, really could be doing a lot of those programs that are on the list, not just one. Um, depending on the size of the organization, and they could have and they could have many providers trained in multiple programs. So, can you start sort of doing the math, and things really add up? So, this leads us to how do we know what's being done and how it's being done? When you start adding up uh, the numbers of evidence-based programs that organizations may offer and the number of providers they have, um, you can really appreciate the great task that's facing organizations about how they're going to keep track of what providers are doing across all these programs, in addition to the day-to-day -day running of an organization, which is a lot. Scheduling and seeing clients, providing supervision, staffing meetings, clinical documentation. Uh, measuring fidelity is an effort, even when you have grant funding and trade trained professionals for this specific purpose, such as in research studies, as Maria talked about earlier. But when you consider the real-world demands, such as productivity expectations, paperwork, challenging clients, um, you things really start to get real, as we like to say. Um, so Maria talked a lot about striking a balance, and I'll just reiterate and underscore that, that uh, we really wanted to strike a balance between capturing some reliable information on what therapists are doing versus what they're saying they're doing, um, but also keeping in mind the realities that face providers and organizations every day. The EVPI, where I work, um, has been uh, partnering with DBHR and, and working with other stakeholders to develop a method for capturing what organizations are doing that would be useful to the state, um, so would be able to know what are the numbers for um, you know, who's doing what, but that would also be minimally burdensome to all stakeholders and hopefully be practical for organizations and something that could be integrated into existing practices. And at this point, I'd just like to thank and acknowledge um, Greg Endler, formerly with DBHR, for his collaboration and partnership um, on this work, as well as my colleague Sarah Walker, who has been um, has put forth great effort and thought into this plan, and um, really could be doing this webinar as well, and has been helping to move the needle in the right direction. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, the other stakeholders involved, um, RSNs as well as provider organizations, clinicians, supervisors who have been providing really valuable feedback and input as we've been thinking about and developing this fidelity approach. 
So in terms of keeping it real, um, I think keeping in mind these three Fs um, that are up on the slide, that we wanted something that was feasible for everyone involved. Um, this would be clinicians, supervisors, reviewers of program practices, um, something that was going to be able to fit within current practices, but we also wanted it to be functional and yield information for states, uh, for the state RSNs and organizations. And, um, and then, of course, uh, we'd love it to be free, but we know there's really no such thing as free. Um, but we really had to be mindful of developing this within the constraints that there was no additional resource provided by the legislature when this bill was passed and, and requiring that, um, that fidelity be, um, be measured in some way. Our thinking around this has been informed by multiple sources. Um, we've turned to the literature around what other state models um, may have been out there. Um, there. There wasn't a lot that sort of was um, going through sort of the same situation that Washington State was. So we've, we've had to draw upon what other states have done, but also be thinking about this as it um, is relevant to Washington State. Um, we've done a survey uh, within Washington State uh, of various stakeholders to get their input, and then also our esteemed colleagues um, who are grappling uh, with these issues. So I want to, at the outset, just note that this is our preliminary um, plan. This is initial thinking, that there, this is not set in stone. I, I want to make sure that everybody um, listening to this understands that. But, our initial thinking around this is to provide flexibility for providers to report adherence to required practice components. And they can do this sort of in one of two ways. And um, the, the reporting would be using the what's called SERI codes or service encounter reporting instructions. And there are specific codes for EVPs. They're called EVP modifiers. And um, one of two ways to be able to capture um, an evidence-based practice. That either they um, can document, providers can document that they've um, gone through an approved training and are receiving ongoing active consultation. And this would be for an evidence-based practice, a research-based practice, um, whether it's a name brand or a more, a more kind of generic or broader approach but that it would be up to the therapist or that therapist organization um, to document that the training counts. Um, so either getting some sort of training certificate um, with the program logo or um, some way of documenting that they have received the, an approved training and they are receiving ongoing active consultation and that could be held within a therapist you know, personnel file that would be easily accessible um, during a, a review. Um, if they don't have this, then a common, ele common elements approach for categories um, that encompass a broad class of EVP programs, so cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety, for example. And I'll be talking about um, these reporting guides in the next few slides. So those are the two different pathways either approved training and active consultation, or these reporting, reporting guides that follow a common elements approach. And we, like I said, are currently in development of this. We are, have produced some initial materials. Um, we are focusing initially on the most common treatment areas for youth right now, um, pretty much depression, anxiety, and trauma. Um, also behavioral problems, but we're continuing to put this through a vetting process with um, various stakeholders. So visuals are always good, um, and I think this slide here reflects what I was just talking about in terms of kind of the two-pronged or two different pathways that one could uh, report evidence-based or research-based practice. So the first question is, um, so this is our proposed decision-making process. If a clinician has received training um, by an approved EVP trainer, um, then they would keep a copy of that, uh, of documentation of that, and the ongoing consultation in a personnel file, and that would take care of it. So if not, then if you look to the right-hand side of the screen, if they've not received um, that training, then they can turn to these reporting guides to document the use of an EVP. 
Um, providers can report the Siri codes for any encounter, which would use a common practice element within the treatment family of that code. Um, and the common practice elements would be provided in reporting guides that um, we here at the EBPI would develop, uh, will be developing. And RSNs are actually, I should no longer say RSNs, and now they're behavioral health organizations, BHOs, um, that are encouraged to support the accurate use of these guides with one of the three following strategies that's outlined on um, the graphic there. Um, that supervisors could check off and sign um, some sort of reporting guide sheet that's kept in the client's case file. That the clinicians themselves could check off and keep a reporting guide in the case file, while also additionally tracking client progress, monitoring outcomes. Or reviewers could use these reporting guides while reviewing clinical charts that would include treatment plans and progress notes and confirm that common practice elements were reflect, reflected accordingly. So the goal is for the reporting guides to serve more than an auditing function. Um, the goal is that the guides provide enough specificity to remove, um, I think, what often um, is being experienced as ambiguity around what counts as a research-based or evidence-based practice, according to the WISIP inventory. And as I have noted earlier, that um, it's following a common elements approach, which recognizes that many programs that have different names, they really have these underlying um, key active ingredients that have been shown to be tied to positive outcomes. And this really comes from a lot of, um, a lot of it comes from the work of Bruce Chorpita and his distillation and matching model that actually looked at over 600 treatments um, in th over 300 um, randomized clinical trials um, and found that there were these common elements that cut across all of the different, um, all of the different studies, all the different trials. And we anticipate these reporting guides could be used by various personnel, um, clinicians, supervisors, or reviewers, auditors, um, and we're, we're leaving up to the individual regions to determine what will work best. So again, if the provider is getting ongoing consultation from an approved entity, then these reporting guides would be moot. Um, the documentation of consultation would waive the need to review any, any case files. Um, so, one, so one area of consideration is looking to um, where did the provider get the training and the ongoing consultation, but also looking at the treatment plan um, and so we would be uh, looking at the treatment plan as well as the individual session, um, which is captured in a progress note. And um, we're thinking about these common elements in two ways. The essential elements for now are those elements that appear in all studies included in the Torpedo review, and the approved elements um, are those that appear in more than one study uh, but not necessarily all the studies for that class of programs. And here is just, again, a snapshot. This is um, not anything that has been disseminated or being used. This is our um, initial thinking of, or an illustration of what a reporting guide for um, a broad category on the inventory might look like. Um, so this would be for cognitive behavioral therapy for anxious children. And it reflects here um, on this slide, it reflects the essential elements for CBT for anxiety, along with a brief description of what that entails. And again, these, were, these um, essential elements are ones that were found in all studies on CBT for anxiety, according to Torpedo's distillation model. And our plan is to develop a reporting guide for every generic category on the inventory, such as CBT, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Depressed Adolescents, Behavioral Parent Training for Children with Disruptive Behavior Disorders. We are hoping to build into the strategy a feedback loop whereby information can be fed back to provider agencies as well as at the BHO level. Um, this would allow for comparisons at the regional level, like what um, both at the organizational level and the regional level, and also, BHOs could compare across other BHOs in addition to 
um, feeding information back up to the to the state. So what we know about feedback is it actually can help to inform and change behavior, and we're hoping that that feedback loop could that this whole process could be a way of helping organizations, providers, to if necessary make make changes in their practice um, for the better. And again, nothing has been formalized. We are in the initial, um, initial planning stages of this. And part of this plan will include a vetting strategy with stakeholders um, to see if it is in line with our, our three Fs, um, the feasible, functional, and sort of free. And then we would use the feedback to refine as, as needed. And we are also in ongoing communication with our DBHR partners around next phases. So to wrap up, um, just to again emphasize how really looking at fidelity approaches is going to be driven by the needs and the goals of those involved in measuring it. And through our research, as Maria mentioned, we have not found many practical fidelity approaches discussed in the literature base, and even less so when you look at those that have empirical data. We've talked about both a micro-level approach um, that Maria gave and then a more macro level approach that I just talked about to measuring fidelity. And we will be synthesizing our literature review results in a paper and um, talking about what's currently out there in the, in the literature, but then also um, hopefully we'll endeavor to move the field forward in this area through uh, future directions and recommendations for next steps uh, with regard to practical approaches to fidelity. We appreciate your attendance in this webinar and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.